You guys are good to go. Got it. All right, just want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Again, my name is Caleb Cooper. I'm an assistant coach at Westtown. I apologize for not having my screen on right now. Again, we had a player issue on campus. Uh, so I'm driving back to uh, my apartment where I'll, uh, I'll throw my collared shirt on and sit in my big man's chair like Jason. But just appreciate all of you guys coming out um, to try and get better tonight. We feel like we have four really great coaches for part two of our G League coaches panel uh, that are really ready to share their stories and, and some advice with some coaches looking to hopefully progress in the business. Um, so again, just want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. And Jason, go ahead. Yeah, like Caleb said, we just appreciate everyone coming, um, especially the coaches presenting today, sharing their knowledge. Me and Caleb just wanted to, you know, share the game, help everyone we can who's willing to learn. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Jason Wayne. I'm going to my junior year of high school in Nanuet, New York. I want to get into the coaching profession, so. Um, let me introduce our guests. We have Coach Oakman, the Long Island Nets. We have Coach Silas. Um, we have Coach Gale, and we have Coach Comercant. Uh, first question goes to Coach Oakman. Um, you spent time coaching at the high school level, as well as Division One, Division Three, and the G League level. How has that time um, in those lower levels pre prepared you for um, what you've been doing now? Jamie, you're muted. Yeah, rookie mistake, huh? Um, well, I appreciate you guys putting this together. First of all, uh, you guys doing great things, especially at your age. It's pretty impressive. And, you know, your questions that you guys kind of posed were well thought out, so I appreciate it. And uh, anybody that has any questions during anything that I say, please feel free to interject. I take no offense. Anything that doesn't make sense that I can clarify, jump in. Uh, you know, looking back, I think you need to understand that this game that we love is a business at the end of the day. Uh, you got to understand everything that you're doing is about the brand that you bring to the team or organization that you work for. With that said, I think being at a variety of different levels gave me an appreciation for the profession. And the lower levels that you're at, they have smaller staffs and you have a kind of a greater breadth of responsibilities associated with it. So with climbing the ladder, your role becomes more specific as you go. And it doesn't mean that you're doing less, but you're really diving into things in a much deeper level. And like, I'm a guy that loves to have his hands in everything and, you know, touch a little bit of this, touch a little bit of that. But even more so what I've found is I'm big on really just diving in, going a whole nother level deeper and trying to help translate that to the game. Uh, you know, I've learned throughout this journey that there's no substitute for the work that you could put in. And, you know, you never want to leave anything to chance. And kind of my theme is going to be preparedness can take you far in this business. And so that that's kind of how I've kind of gone about my business and kind of how, you know, I've kind of climbed through my journey. Yep. Thanks, Coach Oakman. Coach Silas, next question. How did your professional playing career help you um, prepare to coach at this level? Uh, just, the, just the experiences and the knowledge, I think. Um, being able to know that I, that I wanted to coach in my last few years was helpful because I started to pay attention to little things and started to pick up on little things um, here and there. And so it, it's just that experience that you get when you're playing and, and actually walking in those shoes that you have a different understanding with the players on how they feel about certain things, what they're going through. Um, and I think it's just invaluable. Um, and and it's, I think that it's tough to replicate, but I, I think that it's possible I, through a lot of conversations and truly really understanding how players are if you didn't play. But if you played, you have that feeling on your own and you can go off of your own experiences. So I, uh, I think that it's a, it's a helpful deal. That's why uh, you see these, these head coaches um, that have played so long uh, in the NBA getting getting jobs with no coaching experience just because they just have so much uh, knowledge and experience that it's hard to replicate. Yeah, for sure. Just like we just saw Steve Nash got that job at the, with the Nets. Um, Coach Gale, next question's for you. Uh, what did you learn during your time serving in support staff positions for the Clippers and Raptors that allowed you to progress to an assistant coaching role? Um, so... Uh, I I, uh, I took some notes here just to, to write some ideas down. So I'm going to try and um, 
my number one thing that I learned uh, in all those roles is really to simplify things. So I'm going to try and simplify my answer here for you guys as I try and stick to what kind of one of my things is, right? So, um, you know, being consistent um, every single day, like being, being a consistent, like working for Coach Casey and working for Coach Dunleavy, they were extremely consistent every single day. Uh, the person they were, they never got too high, never got too low. Um, they, you know, really, you simplify your playbook, simplify your, your style of communication so there's less thinking for your players. Um, and then kind of coming up through the video room, um, you know, you, you learn how to prepare and how to commit to really to the job. So um, you have to learn to love the grind. You know, being in the video room, you're there. You're the first one in the door most days and you're the last one to leave most nights. So you really have to learn how to love what you're doing um, and commit to it. Uh, and then, you know, in those roles, you get to work with a lot of different people. So um, with the Clippers, you know, I got to work with the front office with, with uh, Neil O'Shea. And then, you know, going to the Raptors, you get to work with Mark Eversley and, and Brian Colangelo and, and the coaching staff. So you're kind of all over. So um, one of the things I think, you know, Menelik, you, uh, you've heard this for sure a lot up in Toronto, like, Masai has preached this from the day he got there um, was everything matters. Every little detail matters. Like nothing is too small. So, um, you know, like I said, being around these people, you kind of pick up these little tidbits here and there. So um, it's that it's understanding the details. And then um, one thing I, I, I think is really important that, that first I saw uh, Vinny Del Negro do it. And then Coach Casey, and I know it's become a, a thing that a lot of coaches do now, but is um, sharing, sharing role cards with players. And then I think that, I think that translates to everybody in the organization is just understanding your role, um, understanding how you fit, staying in your lane. Uh, a lot of young coaches, and I was, uh, I was you know, I fell into this. Uh, it, you want to do more. You want to you be given more responsibility. You want to be looked at differently. And I think understanding your role and how you fit in the grand scheme of things, everything else will eventually take care of itself um, if you just play your role. Uh, and, then, and then the last thing I'd like to share is like the, the power of positivity. You know, I think, um, I think when, you're, when, when you're empowered and you're, you're, the, the people um, around you are very positive with you, I think it translates uh, into your work, it translates into you wanting to come to work and how hard you work and I, I think, uh, I've really become a big believer in that and, and kind of tried to uh, share that as I've become a, an assistant and, and uh, head coach the last couple of years. Yeah, that's great. I love that. Next question, Coach Domer Kent. Coach, you pl played professionally overseas and in the G League for a few years. Um, how did this time prepare you to be an assistant coach in the G League? Um, in a lot of ways, uh, to, I guess, be brief. One of the ways I think that jumps out the most is communication, especially playing for us overseas in as many situations as I have, learning to communicate uh, to many different people, many ages, different groups, and also communicate the same language of basketball in different ways. I think that's one thing that's really prepared me and just communicating with others because I think in basketball, or in any other business where you want cooperation. I think communication of ideas is a very big thing, whether it's communicating roles or communicating anything. I just think uh, helping me be a communicator, I think is one way it, uh, that that prepared me. Another way would be, I can't uh, stress enough is work ethic. You know, I wasn't the McDonald's All-American or whatever, and I had to work for every situation that I got or every job that I had or every level that I got. And um, I think that translate, whether it's the business world, whether it's basketball, I think that translates to also how you prepare. And for my experience so far, my young experience as a coach, preparation, you know, is, you know, one of the main factors of points of emphasis, I think, to success. And uh, in short, playing, being able to play for many different coaches, like I said, many different countries, uh, you acquire a certain type of basketball intellect. You don't just learn the game one way. And uh, even in coaching as well, being a, I've coached 
three years now with three different coaches. And I've been able to learn different things from each coach. And I think just acquiring a certain level of basketball intellect from different situations also helped prepare me, I think, to help uh, become a better coach, ultimately. Awesome. Um, Caleb, you need me to do round two, too? Yeah, can you get started with round two? All right, awesome. I feel like I didn't give you guys a proper introduction. So second time around, coaches, would you guys like to just introduce yourselves, give a pre brief uh, background? Um, Coach Oakman, second question, what advice would you share to a coach looking to transition from high school coaching to college coaching and college coaching to the G League or the NBA? Yeah, so Jimmy Oakman, my second year, I just finished with the Long Island and Brooklyn Nets, uh, coached Division One, Division Three high school levels before that. Um, so I've seen a little bit. So your question kind of, you know, hits on that. I think my best overall advice is kind of, it isn't who, like they always say, it's not what you know, it's who you know. But I, I like to take it like a step further. Like it's who knows what you know, because they're not going to hire you. Like it, it's not, it's cool. I know you, I'm going to hire you. They, they got to trust you, right? So you got to be good at what you do. And that, that supersedes anything. And, you know, relationships are built up over time um, and you got to foster trust which can eventually lead to a job down the road. You don't know when it could happen, but it could take years. It might never happen. But I think if you're organic in the relationships and care about putting the time in, that's how you're kind of going to grow. And for me, while coach at the lower levels, whether it's, you know, high school, AAU, youth, you need to network with anybody and everyone, but you need to be intentional if you plan on doing it in this business. I, I don't think you can be fake and you can't hide uh, kind of who you are. I think people can sniff that out pretty well. Like you can't fool players either. So if you're, not true and transparent, people are gonna figure that out pretty quickly. Um, so networking is definitely an art and it comes natural for a lot of people, right? Like for me, it doesn't, I'm much more introverted and I know that. So when in situations I try to find myself doing a lot more homework on people ahead of time. And you know, if I'm going to watch a practice back when I was in college, I'm gonna find out everything about the staff I can. I'm gonna look at the roster construction, find out the X and O's. In case they ask me a question on it, I wanna be prepared. And that's kind of how I approach everything. And same thing with our team. Uh, going into a game, I want to know every single thing so that I can be prepared. So same way I approach, um, you know, the transition from high school to college and kind of going from college to the NBA. Uh, you know, and, and from getting to the college level, the pro level, I think that message doesn't change. You know, you got to be intentional and organic about the relationship building. You're never going to build a true relationship with somebody probably from a cold call. It, it's not going to happen. It's going to be because you're in a situation where it's in an event or, you know, whether it's a tournament Final Four, Summer League, whatever that case is, that's where real conversations happen. Your friend introduces somebody. It's not going to be you just picking up the phone and dialing a number and saying, hey, like, this is who I am. It, that generally doesn't happen. So I think you need to put yourself in those situations where people are going to be. Go prepared and be you. And don't be somebody else. Because, you know, if you're fake, like I said, it's not going to work out in the long run. That's great advice, Jimmy. Um, next question for Coach Silas. Again, just introduce yourself first. What did the transition from player to coach look like for you? What are some things former players can do while playing um, after their careers have ended when looking to transition to coaching? All right, well, I'm, I'm Xavier Silas. I, I played nine years professionally. I just got done with my first year coaching with uh, the Delaware Blue Coats in the Sixers organization. Uh, I think that the main thing that I, I was, like Coach Oak said, man, I was very intentional in what I wanted to do. Um, I knew that I wanted to coach, so my last year in the G League, I had back problems, my back was acting up. And so instead of just sitting on the, uh, instead of sitting on the bench, I asked them if I could live code a game in the back with, with the video guy. And so the video guy sat back there, he, he taught me how to do it, he let me do a quarter the first time, then he let me do a half, and then, before you know it, he was sitting on the bench and I was back there live coding the game on my own. And so, you know, it was, it's just little things like that, you know, reaching out to your network. I, I had the, um, I had a great opportunity to play for Jeff Van Gundy and, and Jeff Bizdelic and, you know, uh, Brad Stevens and Mike Malone and all these people. And so when I, I just started reaching out like, hey, I'm, I want to get into coaching. What do I do? What do I need to do? And one of the, the, the 
best pieces of advice uh, Coach Van Gundy called me and he said, look, just coach. Like, just coach as much as you can. I don't care if it's Little League. I don't care if it's wherever. Just try to coach and get that clipboard in your hand. Start making those decisions. Start thinking about the game in that way. Um, because you're a player now, you have to start thinking about how you want to coach and who you are. And, and Scott Roth, I, I played with for him, and, and he had a, a great thing. Well, a lot of people had the same thing. Vinny Del Negro and everybody, they, they all said the same thing, which was uh, – start writing down everything, right? Write down what you want to do, who you want to be. And, you know, like it's just a common theme with coaches and, and, and successful coaches is they, they, they write everything down and they can go back to their notes. Butch Carter, same stuff. You can go back to their notes from 30 years ago and uh, figure it out. And so for me, I, I guess the answer to that question is just start using your network, start using your resources, reach out to people because you learn so many different things from different people. Like, like H said, you know, he, he, going and, and playing overseas, they, they see things differently and, and how you communicate with everybody. It's just so much information. And if you want that information, you can get it. But, but if you just say you want to coach and you don't do anything about it, that's not, that's not going to happen. And so I, I sought out the, the uh, NBA assistant coaches program and I started reaching out to contacts and I let people know you know, that I wanted to do it. And then it's the same thing. It's just, I, I, I still, uh, I'm doing the same thing, figuring out, I, I, I hit D Gale up. He can tell you, I DM him, Hey, you know, uh, w what did you do? What was your transition like and all that stuff? And so I think you're onto something, Jay, as far as, as what you're doing already, because this is what you want to do. But my, my suggestion will be go out and inquire and ask questions and try to figure it out. Yeah, that's great. I know we have a couple uh, people in here transitioning from playing to coaching. So that's great advice. Caleb, you got it from here. Yeah, no, I think uh, what, what Coach Silas just said is big time. I know a lot of the times in coaching, a lot of people feel like because they're in coaching, they feel like their head coach or their assistants know they want to move up. But if that's not verbalized to the staff, then they're not going to be able to help you. So I really appreciated Coach Silas kind of breaking that down because I think a lot of coaches kind of fall into that trap. So appreciate that. Uh, I just want to personally thank all the coaches again for being on here. I, I know I'm on camera now, so uh, now we can really get things rolling. So, uh, Coach Gale, uh, you transitioned from support staff to an assistant coach, and now you're serving as a head coach. Uh, so since you kind of have the, the viewpoint from all three positions, what are some of the things you're looking to, uh, looking to have in an assistant or support staff member when you're kind of building your staff? Uh, so um, I guess let me uh, introduce myself like the other guys did. So I uh, – I started off with the Clippers um, in the video room for, I was there for four years with coach Dunleavy and coach Del Negro. Uh, I moved to the Raptors uh, with coach Casey and I was there for six years, uh, two years fully in the video room, two years on the second row of the bench, and then two years with the 905 team. Uh, and then I went to Delaware for a year. Uh, and then the last two years I've been in Germany serving as a head coach for um, MHP Reason and Porsche BBA there. So um, I don't have a lot of experience hiring my own staff, um, but I did. I have I have done it the last two years. So I think a couple of the things I, I I've looked for in my assistants, uh, especially year one, I kind of inherited some guys, and year two I was able to learn from that experience some more. So um, some of those things I think are things that I learned from the coaches I worked for. Um, you know, I, I uh, learned from uh, some of the guys, like uh, the player development guys I was with, uh, like Eric Hughes, who's on this call, uh, Billy Baino, Jesse Mermis, all about building relationships. Um, so I, I really look for coaches that are able to communicate, like, like Henry said, um, communicate their message clearly and, and able to reach the players and build these relationships where uh, the players know how much you care about them. Um, I think that's extremely important. Guys have to know you care. Uh, I think that someone that you want to spend time or that I want to spend time with outside of practice. Uh, so not just someone who, who I, I can go to practice with, get on the court, and then we go separate ways. I want someone that I can hang out with outside of that. Uh, go have dinner. Uh, our, you know, our wives can get together, hang out, 
um, you know, it, it, it's a relationship that you want to build on. Uh, it's not just about basketball. Uh, again, that's another thing that, um, that I learned from some of the guys I was with, you know, it's as much as it is about basketball and the commitment to it, it it's about the relationships outside the game as well. So um, finding guys that, that you can connect with and, and, and like uh, Jimmy said, like you're real, you know, the relationship is real. It's not, it's not built on, on a fake, um, a, a, a fake networking event or something like that. Um, people that are, are open to thinking outside the box. I think that's, that's one thing I really learned. Um, you know, everyone now watches, watches coach nurse, uh, in Toronto. Uh, but you know, when he was an assistant, I had the, I, I was lucky enough to work under him in the video room and, and he really, it's outside the box. It's, it's all these, you know, um, people ask, what does that mean? But it's like, uh, at the time, one of the things he was really big on was changing up the tag guy. So we'll run the same play three different times and just move the pieces around. And so it changes who's in the tag position, who's in the pick and roll. Um, so that's just an example. But, uh, you know, I would want an assistant coach with me that's willing to think outside the box, throw some crazy ideas off the wall, see what sticks. Um, that was one way Stack, Coach Stackhouse really put it. Throw it off the wall, see what sticks, and we'll, we'll take it and we'll try it. And if it works, let's run with it. So um, I think finding people that are willing to try new things, adjust on the fly. Um, and then I think the last thing that I really looked for in, in my assistant coach that I found last year um, was someone who loves the game and understands, understands the grind that it takes to, to um, be a professional coach. You know, it's, it's not just, uh, it's not just coming to practice or, um, you know, being there for a couple hours before practice, it's, it's, it's all day long. It's all year long. It's, you know, workouts in the summertime. It's late nights in the gym with, uh, you know, for me, it was with DeMar DeRozan and Kyle Lowry coming back at 10 o'clock at night. So it's, it, it's really, it's someone who understands the grind of the job um, and is willing to, to commit to uh, getting everyone better, building, building the program and getting your players better. I oh, appreciate that coach. I mean, I think we all, we should all know that when, when we, when we take these jobs, they're not nine to five jobs. You're working a lot of hours outside of that because as a coach, there's so many things that, that we're required to do because ultimately we want what's best for our players. We want them to be successful. So like you said, giving up your time, obviously there's a bunch of other things that you want to do, but when you love your players and they ask you to work out at 10 o'clock at night, you want to do that because it'll help them get better. So I really appreciate that. And then lastly, uh, Coach Henry, our last question. So again, just like Jason said, if you could give us a quick bio um, about yourself, your journey, and then your question is, you've been fortunate enough to work for a couple of different coaches um, in your, your time coaching in the G League. What are some things that you've been able to learn from, uh, from each of your head coaches over the past three years? Hello. Uh, yeah, I'm Henry McDonald. I played professionally for 13 years. 13 or 14, I'm, I'm getting old. Uh, primarily in Europe, one year in the G League as well. I've coached, my first season was in Maine uh, under obviously the Boston Celtics G, uh, G League affiliate. The last two years I've been with the Windy City Bulls, obviously the Bulls, Chicago Bulls affiliate. Another interesting fact, I guess, before I answer the question is that now being with the Bulls, uh, I've also been under two head coaches. They've had coaching changes from the main club, and now they're obviously looking for their third. So that also brings about some unique transition as well. Um, to answer the question, if I if I get it right, uh, what you said, what, is, what are some things I've learned from each coach? Correct. Wow. Uh, like, I, I think it was Dave. Dave said, you pick up tidbits along the way, right? And some things I can remember pretty vividly from Coach Bailey, obviously under Brad Stevens, you know, which is, he, who, uh, he's, he probably was in the organization seven years before he became a head coach for, Wendy, uh, for the main Red Claws, uh, was be a star in your role as assistant coach. You know, so we all have aspirations. We all have goals to get to certain places. But initially, you know, you may have a role, you may not, you may love it, you may not, but be a star in your role where you are. And then um, look to uh, 
look to help others also do your job, do it well, and then also be able to try to help others with their job whenever, wherever you see a need, you know, try to add value. That was one of the main things he preached. And uh, I think it, it serves everyone well as a part of the staff to, to do that. Uh, Charlie was, uh, Charlie Henry, who's now, I think he's coaching at Alabama, assistant coach at Alabama under Coach Oates. His big phrase, the one thing I think I picked up from him was no gray area. He loved, he didn't want to coach in the gray, especially defensively. Uh, everyone, he wanted everyone to know where they should be and there wasn't many, you know, much confusion. And sometimes, especially offensively, there's some gray or there's some randomness to it. But I think one of the big takeaways that year was to uh, really try to remove the gray area for our guys. And uh, Coach Cotter, who I've just been under, he, uh, the development was more than just a philosophy or a catchphrase. Uh, he was intentional about developing not only the players, but his staff, which, you know, I think uh, I grew from a lot and, you know, it aided me in my, develop, I guess, development, to say the word. I think, uh, especially our league being, you know, the developmental league, I think sometimes that can get lost when we're focused on wins or focused on could be your own coaching, personal aspirations or whatever it is, but truly not only caring about the players, but development being, you know, a major factor and in input in all of your decisions, whether that's the staff, players, or whoever, whether it's the business side, I think development was a more than a philosophy, I guess, to him. And also be you as a coach. I, I Playing overseas, I played for a lot of you, Yugoslavia or ex-Yugoslavian coaches who um, had a pretty consistent style among them. And for a long time, I felt like I couldn't be a head coach because I couldn't coach that way. And a lot of those coaches were the successful coaches in Europe during my time. And um, that wasn't my personality or the style I wanted to be a, be a part of. But he showed, you know, he really showed me another way. Also, being an international coach who's Australian, but um, just using his personality and his influence, using the international style, more of an international style in the NBA developmental league, just showed me that, you know, you can be you as a coach and still have some success and, you know, you can still be a head coach. And you don't think you have to be like any other coach that you had, per se. No, I think that's um, that's definitely big time, Coach, because obviously you have to be yourself and you have to do what's going to make you most successful. And, and I think authenticity is, is one of the things that players can kind of sniff out. If you're not being authentic in your true self, the players are going to know that automatically. They're going to be able to tap into to, to what you do and what you do well. So appreciate that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, coaches, I just have one more question for all of you guys, and then uh, we'll open it up for um, everyone else to ask questions. Me, uh, Caleb and I can, have kind of talked about this in terms of relationships or building, you know, networking and stuff like that. Be transactional, add value instead of just, you know, saying happy holidays, hope you're doing well. Can you guys kind of just talk about that a little bit? I'll jump in. Um, I think that's important. You know, I think, especially when I was younger in this business, when I first started going, I think I wanted to like keep private stuff that I learned along the way. Um, for me now, like everything I do, I just try to share and to create conversation. Like if I do a study on something or I'm watching a ton of film, I want to give that information out because if I give it out, it's going to force me to keep studying to learn more. Because if I give you everything, you're going to know what I know and I need to keep pushing forward. And at the very least, hopefully it creates some conversation with somebody I share that information with. So uh, I think it's important to give. And, you know, you don't need to receive just because you give. Give because you want to, you know, help grow this game that we all, you know, hopefully can have a living off of. And uh, that's the right thing to do, to give back. And that's just the way I kind of approach it. And it's kind of, you know, been pretty good for me. Yeah, I um one of the things I do is, is when I'm watching basketball or I have a thought, I'll just, I'll just text somebody and, and see what they think about it. 
you know, like I was watching Portland and they were trapping Dame as soon as he crossed half court and they were putting Nurkic in that short roll. And they kept doing it and kept doing it. And I thought that it was really killing them. And so I just text a few of the head coaches that I know, hey, what adjustment would you make with this? And that's like an organic, real way. Instead of saying, oh, hey, uh, happy holidays or Merry Christmas or whatever, that's an organic, real way to, to keep a relationship going and kind of learn something as you go. So, um, you know, when you're watching stuff or you're breaking down film or you have a thought, I would just say, just reach out to somebody that you respect that you want to know the answer and ask that question. Yeah, I think, uh, I think, uh, actually you, you, you kind of took what I, part of what I was going to say there. I think reaching out to guys just, just to do it. Um, one, you can bug them a little bit and, and it seems fake, right? It's just like, oh, you're just texting me just, just to say hello, just so I know you still are around. Um, so uh, one thing I know being overseas the last two years that I kind of tried to do because of the time difference was in order to stay in contact with some of the people that, that I consider to be, you know, close to me in the business, um, I, I would try and make a schedule, like schedule it out when I was going to call somebody which might sound like, um, might sound like it, it's, you know, kind of fake, but at the same time, it, it, you get caught up in your daily schedule and practice in planning practice and watching film. And then you've got your life at home. So I think um, for me, it was, it was really making a conscious effort to continually reach out to people that, that I'm close with. And then through that, you just, the relationships become more and more real. You, you remain um, kind of in contact with what's happening um, in, in different organizations, different styles of play, and the, and the, the conversations are much more organic um, when it's, you know, it, 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 you're calling for a reason just, you know, rather than just to say, hey, I'm here, hello, you know. So um, I think making a schedule every day is really one thing that, that helps me um, keep in contact with people. Uh, Not, for me, go oh, go ahead, Coach. Sorry. I was just gonna say, for me, you know, those are all really good answers. I haven't, <laughs> I probably haven't done this as well as I should. You know, if I'm being honest, uh, a lot of times I tend to just reach out to people I've already had a relationship with prior. Um, but any new ones, you know, I try to be a resource, and um, I try to like 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 they said add value or maybe ask a question or share share something I think is great but honestly I'm I think this is an area I can grow in so no I appreciate all those and I especially like what coach Silas talked about kind of just starting up that conversation on coach what would you do if you were in this situation because then that kind of that gets the 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 basketball conversation going and again like some of the coaches talked about, coaches like uh, Coach Oakman talked about, coaches are going to hire you for what you know and what they know that you know. So if you can have a complex basketball conversation with a coach that that is going to be looking for an assistant or looking for a support staff member in a couple of years, and you're constantly having these high-level basketball conversations with them, they're going to be the first one that they come to mind when it is time to hire that. I mean, kind of what, what Jason and I talked about, Phil Martelli Jr., an assistant at Bryant, told me a couple months ago that reaching out to college coaches saying, hey, coach, like, happy Father's Day, different things like that. They'll never, they'll, never, they'll never look to hire you because they don't know what you know again. But if you're constantly adding value like Jason talked about and putting different resources with some of the things that I've suggested that he do as he tries to navigate this business, I think that's so much more beneficial because it's, again, showing the value that you'll be adding to a program if they were, um, if they were to hire you. So really appreciate that question, Jason. Uh, so now we're going to open it up for questions. Uh, so if you have a question, just drop your name in the chat. Uh, when, when it's your time to ask your question, just introduce yourself to the coaches. Uh, tell them who you are, uh, where you're currently working at, and we'll go from there. So first we have Safet. So Safet, un, uh, unmute yourself and uh, you can ask your question. Yeah, Caleb, just real quick. I just want to add on to that. Um, recently, like me and Caleb talked about it. Since I've started like trying to send videos or stuff like that to coaches, I've really felt like it's made the conversation more genuine and just, it's just, you know, it feels more real. So that's definitely a big thing. 
Thanks, Caleb and Jason. I hope everyone's doing well. My name's Safet Castra, and I'm a student manager at Ryder University. And I also work for uh, Chad Babel at Main Hoops. This is a quick question for Coach Dom Uh This basketball world is so small. I was actually texting Thrill Hill, Kyle, right before uh, I got on here. And su That's super, good. super small world. Uh, so I'm from, my parents are from uh, ex-Yugoslavia, Albania, and Bosnia. And I wanted to ask you a question on the cultural side of it. For you playing out there, how, how was it, first of all? And how long did it take for you to adapt? And what was something that you took that we don't do in America on the developmental side that you think American basketball coaches, trainers, et cetera, can implement? Wow. Uh... It was a different time, obviously, when I started over there. So this was pre, pre iPod, pre FaceTime. This was AOL Messenger and and uh, what is it, the Internet Cafe. So uh, communicating definitely was different. Basketball now is a universal language. I think the younger generation, it's more people who speak English. So definitely just trying to embrace the culture and learn from my teammates. I think that helped take me a lot farther because I was an American who was willing to do that. Um, what was the second question again? I don't want to, I don't want to talk too long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just real quick. What was something that, that you took in, in the Yugoslavian countries that you, that you played in that something they do different in Yugoslavia that we could take in America basketball developmental wise? that we don't do or you didn't see growing up playing? Um, wow. I think uh, as far as a team practice and things like that, I think they do more team shooting overall. We're, we're so uh, individual workout heavy and things like that, but also just shooting in practice. You know, some guys, especially during the season, uh, you may have some guys want to get up shots after and some guys who don't, or you got to drag them in things like that, but just uh, shooting as a team and doing different dr drills like that, I think uh, they em that's emphasized more. Also, I think at times we can be so position specific here. And I think earlier on, it didn't matter if you were 6'10 or you were 5'10, you know, you were still working on a lot of the same things. And I think that's why, you know, fundamentally a lot of there's for a long time overseas, had some things that we didn't have as far as developing bigger talent or young talent. Thank you, Coach. I appreciate that. Yeah, Menelik, you could go. <clears throat> uh, hi, everyone. I'm Menelik Fernandez. I am the interim head coach of Fleming College up here in Canada. Uh, I have a bit of a relationship with a few of you, but uh, Xavier, first time meeting you. Henry, first time meeting you. Thank you for doing this, first of all. So obviously I'm on the Rising Coaches accounts, so I'll say that. Uh, my question is this, at your, uh, your levels, and like I said, I've interacted with a couple of you guys fairly frequently, so I, I definitely want to hear your perspectives as well. Don't think just because we've interacted before, I don't. It's to all four of you. At your particular level, how are you choosing projects that are sort of outside of your job description to keep yourself sharp keep yourself getting better, improve, et cetera. Like I, I know that we watch a ton of video at the levels that, that you guys are at. So what are you doing outside of that and how are you choosing it? For me, um, I've done a lot of research just on the benefit of reading. And it's not so much about what you're reading or if it has to be about basketball or whatever, but just expanding your mind. I know, I think I saw Ryan Richmond on here. We always have a lot of conversations and have for a lot of years now on different books that you can read that just change. It changes your perspective on things. It's going to change the type of person you are, which ultimately is going to change the type of coach that you are. And so, um, like for me, uh, what I've been doing and what I chose to do is just try to read as many books as I can during this time. Um, different types of books about all types of different things. Um, and it's, it, it just has helped me grow in different ways that I'm sure when coaching starts back up for me and, and everyone else, uh, I'm going to approach things differently. So that would be my answer to that. 
Appreciate it. Thank you. I'll kind of hit on how I kind of decide on the projects I'm looking for. Uh, for me, it was all about, especially in season, was how can I make the head coach's job easier? Th that was kind of how I looked at it. Like whatever I can do to add value that's going to take something off his plate, um, whether it's, you know, we're playing, you know, the 905, right? And this is their end of game stuff. And then, like, I was kind of my responsibility to look after all that anyways, but like, I'm just diving in deep. Like, how can I make this information digestible for him? And the easier I could do that and, you know, kind of starring in your role, right? Like I, I was responsible for our rotations. Well, who can I learn from that does the rotations for other teams? What are they doing? Like, how do you um, add value in that sense? So I'm always trying to take what I do and then kind of expand on it. And um, some ideas are dumb. Like not everyone's going to be a hit for sure. And, and you know, you, sometimes it feels like you waste your time, but you're going to learn along the way. And I think, you know, if you're just trying to learn and do it, you know, in a genuine fashion, I think, you know, there's going to be benefit in that no matter what. Appreciate it, Jimmy. Thanks. Um, so I, I think for myself, uh, having the opportunity to be a head coach the past couple of years, I think I tried to, um, I tried to take some ideas from coaches that I had worked for or had the, uh, you know, uh, ability to be around and, and try and do some stuff off the court. Uh, so so with my team uh, in Germany, we, I looked for ways that were uh, of like team bonding activities that weren't your typical things. So um, ways to get guys to, to bring guys together. And, and so I tried to uh, talk to different coaches that, that I've been around or go back on my notes. You know, I think it was, it was uh, Jimmy that said it, guys who have notes for years and years and years, right? So um, like I went back and looked at some notes I'd taken from past years but just looking for new ideas and new ways to bring guys together off the court um, was one thing. Uh, and then also, um, uh, you know, using, using all your resources uh, at your disposal and, and um, trying to uh, help yourself grow from, from where you happen to be. So uh, for me, it was, you know, I, I was in Europe. I wanted to take advantage of being in Europe. So I wanted to learn from the coaches that were over there. So um, whether it was my scout for a game where I was an assistant coach with the, with the pro club or uh, another league I wanted to watch or something like that, I tried to, tried to take advantage of the opportunity of being, being in Germany and, and watch EuroLeague teams and, and get ideas that, you know, you don't really see, you don't really see um, in American basketball. Uh, and, and just really, you know, take advantage of that. Thanks for that. Uh, for me, it was a couple of things, I guess, especially during quarantine, we had a lot of time. I, uh, trying to help, obviously, the team, I was just looking at what were we bad at? You know, I thought as far as the Bulls were, for a lot of the season, we're a pretty good defensive team, even though we struggle so much on offense. And uh, so I said, I went online and I just started researching. Our team basically scouted the team. I said, what were we bad at? And then just research why. You know, if I picked out a situation, just research why. And then, you know, gave it to one of the assistant coaches. Uh, and as far as myself, uh, one of the things that actually Coach Cotter his influence again was about cultivating strengths, you know, and developing. And, and so some of the things I was interested in, and I guess some of the things I was, I guess had a knack for as a player was shooting the basketball. So I said, well, how can I teach, how can I teach shooting better? How can I make corrections and help people grow in this area? And uh, so I started research, researching NBA shooting coaches and learn, get, gathering information and then formulating my own opinion and creating something in that way. Also, um, as far as, you know, in the G League, you wear many hats, like a lot of you guys know, and really wanting to be able to help develop our guys better as to what, what are some things that, what positions do we struggle at and what are some things that helped us this year grow and help, our, what, what, what do I think can help in the future? And so, you know, simple thing like it could be, you know, 90% of the G League is in the drop for pick and roll. So how can, what are some new ways or what are some ways I can help coach our guys to be better attacking the drop, whether it's 
you know, the roll man or whether it's the ball handler. And, uh, you know, just putting together an edit or a teach tape and just have many different things that we can drill and just really honing in on some things so I can just firm them in my mind so I can be able to just teach them better, communicate them better, and, you know, just point out some ways to have success, hopefully a little bit faster. Coach, thank you. The, uh, the teaching points one is one that like I dwell on a lot. I, I'm fascinated by how to teach better a lot of the time. Appreciate you saying that. Yeah, those were awesome answers. Um, just a huge thanks to Menoik. He's been moderating, moderating these Zooms all summer long. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do this without him. So we appreciate you, Menelik. Um, you. Appreciate you. We got Manny next. Good evening, guys. First and foremost, coaches, thank you for your time. Uh, Manny here, uh, GA, Michigan State University. Uh, for coaches that are interested in learning about the G League, you know, for guys that want to learn about the college level, you know, you got the Final Four, you go to Peace Jam, tied in with a good prep or AU program, where would you start besides a DM or a cold call if you do want to learn more about the G League and build the relationships when things do go back to normal? Uh, sorry, any, anyone of you guys can answer this. Uh, point just one of you guys is fine. Yeah. That's a tough question. I, you know, I, don't, I think there's a million ways. In, I see David laughing, but, like, I, I think, you know, there's a million ways to do it in this business, and I, and I think this is a great way, right? Like, stuff like this and being open and trying to be as authentic as possible is the best way you can kind of do it. And, you know, I put my number in the chat and I mean, like anybody that's in here, please shoot me a text. Like, like you said, kind of asking that question, like I would love to elaborate more and go into more detail and answer any questions that people have. Um, I don't know the right answer. I don't know if there is a perfect one, but things like this for me have been truly valuable. That's why I try to join every single Zoom call I can get on just so I can rub some elbows. You know, you might know somebody that knows somebody that can connect me and, uh, you know, just this being on it and being here is valuable uh, I think one thing uh, is the showcase you know once we start to have that I think that's where all teams are gathered right any NBA event uh, the set, a lot of the decision makers for the G League are also for the pro club as well so any NBA event you can do or attend I think that helps and uh like everyone said, it's games or any other where any any place where there's the G League happening or a G League event, try to be and try to make contacts like and, you know, do the whole networking thing that I guess Jimmy said that I'm still bad at. Um, I, I would say, you know, you, you said don't don't cold call or, or, or like not don't do it, but maybe it's not always looked at the right way. I, I think most people I've come in contact with in coaching uh, in the NBA or in the G League are, are genuinely good people for the most part. And so I, I think, um, and I've kind of changed my opinion on this as I've gotten older and, and I think uh, matured a little bit and grown up in the business that I think reaching out to people, you know, whether it's Twitter or, or text message or Instagram or whatever it is, wherever you, you, you can contact them, I think most people will, will get back to you. Um, and then, you know, then you kind of go from there. If, it, if you have connections, if you have um, some sort of common ground, I think you can build a relationship. But, uh, you know, for me, like, like Jimmy said about these platforms here, like, you know, most of the times I've spoken on a platform um, on a Zoom call has been me reaching out to somebody and saying, hey, uh, I would like to speak for you guys. And, and you know, and, and it's worked. So um, I think unless until you ask or until you contact people uh you know you don't really know i agree with everyone I don't, I don't think that there's one way to do it um if you're looking for a physical place where all the g league people are together there's definitely the showcase um that a lot of people are there um but you know everyone's working sometimes they're chilling but i i would say that that's the equivalent to the final four for uh for the g league um but yeah I, I just think that you have to knock on the door and keep knocking until someone answers honestly i don't, I don't think that there's a a right way to do it and, and you're going to hear a whole bunch of no's and 
Yeah, but I, I think that you got you got to be consistent when it comes to that. Appreciate if you. Add, if I could add one more thing, um, I think like you're a Michigan State guy. I think you should reach out to some alums. I think there's that common bond. I've seen that, you know, carry guys to actually help guys or do something. Some I had one guy reach out to me. I connect from Arkansas. I connected him to Gennaro Pargo, and he a former Arkansas player. He wanted to, you know, help him, and he connected with him. And you know, our former coach for the Bulls was Jim Boylan. And he was a Michigan State guy. And I felt like there was always somebody new from Michigan State walking through, through the doors. And so I think, guys, that common bond will go further than you think. And, and just to jump into it, you, you know, Henry, you brought something up great, too, that, you know, kind of jogged my mind on it. Manny, like, you're at Michigan State. You guys have great players. Probably all your seniors are going to play professionally somewhere. Um, so whether you send them to us, NBA, overseas, like you already, you're going to have the film edits on these guys already done. Like you can start putting together your own stuff for them. Like forget whoever agent they have, like you can do it. And so it doesn't hurt. It's going to build a relationship. It's going to, you know, refine your own skills. You're going to see things in their game that you can relate to the player. And then you can relate to coaches that you want to network with just, you know, kind of spitball on ideas, but you're, you're in a prime position to kind of go both ways. Appreciate you guys' time. Yeah, that was some great answers, great question. Like you said, everyone knows the NCAA Final Four, but G League Showcase, not a lot of people know about. Great point. Um, Chase, your next next question. Thank you. Coaches, appreciate your time. Uh, Mr. Um, my name is Chase Crawford. I'm a student manager at the University of Georgia. Mr. Gale, sir, I had a question for you. So personally, as a student manager whose interest lies in the video and analytics side, I was interested to know after your two years working in the video room, what would you say contributed most to your movement from the video room to an assistant coaching position? Uh, so it was actually six years in the video room. Um, so it's a, it's a long grind. It's a long grind in the video room. Um, I, I would say uh, one thing I hit on earlier is just like really understanding that uh, you're, you're like the go-to guy for everything. And so being there first and being there last and, and making sure everyone sees that you're, you're there and you're available, um, making yourself available. Uh, and then one thing uh, I, I learned, I think it was in my third year with the Clippers, uh, John Lucas was an assistant coach there. And he, he kind of told me, and then the coaches when I got to Toronto kind of reminded me of this is get your work done early so you can get on the court. So get, get the video done, be prepared, um, have everything the coaches need, and then you're not being pulled in 10 different directions to do a bunch of different tasks, and you can get on the court and help rebound, and they can start to see you in a different light. Because um, that's the biggest thing, is they need to see you um, – in a different way than just the video guy. Um, and that's one thing I think people, sometimes you'll see, or you used to at least see video coordinators be in the video room for 15, 20 years, where they just got stuck in that role because uh, you get comfortable and, and you just do what you're asked to do and, and you don't kind of push yourself out of that comfort zone. So uh, for me personally, like in Toronto, I would get to the, to the arena sometimes at five in the morning and, and you know that's an extreme example but you know six seven whatever it is and you get done before the coaches get there so when practice starts you can load their computers up and you can get on the court yes sir thank you very much you're welcome greg uh greg you can unmute yourself and ask your question yeah i appreciate it thanks guys uh just a, a quick question on um a little bit of work-life balance sort of sort of question I had. I, it, it, ever, being in this game, it's, it's a massive amount of hours that you have to put in to, to do your job properly. Advice: I, I'm married with three kids, so it's so it's an interesting an interesting balance to have to work. Any advice on, you know, as you move up the level? Uh, sorry, I'm a, I'm a college coach. Is this a, at Fanshawe College here in Ontario, uh, same league as Manalik there. And, um, you know, it, it, as I hear stories from, from everybody talking, it's like two years here, three years there, 
two years overseas. How do you sell your significant other on that? And, and, and then how on that do you, do? because obviously they're going to have uh, dreams or, or, or goals or ambitions as well. What advice would you give on how to, how to work that out? Um, I'm in my fourth year coaching college now as an assistant and, and obviously same as everybody else in this call or else they wouldn't be here. Uh, being a head coach is obviously sort of where I would like to go, whether it's in Canada or, or wherever. Um, how do you sell that to your significant other that, Hey, we can work here for two years and work here for two years and, and go. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> I see some deep breaths being taken in there. Woo! <laughs> hey, I'll, I'll jump in. I'll jump in. Cause I actually, I had the same question. Um, when I first started, uh, I remember thinking like, how do these coaches have kids and have families and travel uh, all the time and, and in the, in the office all the time and all that. I think, um, I can't remember what coach it was that told me this. Uh, I think it was probably one that had been divorced at least one time. Um, but you know, they said to find someone, Find someone that that understands and, and, and is they, they that understands um, the work, the hours. Um, and then I think along with that, there's got to be a balance. Um, you've got to figure out a way to have a schedule or have um, some time mapped out where you can separate yourself from work. And I'm not I'm not very good at this. Um, I think my wife will tell you that. Um, so. Uh, you know, coming home and bringing your work home with you. Uh, I think you have to be able to uh, at some point turn it off and figure out a way of how many hours that is or what it is, but or what the, your non-negotiables are um, of when you can have your family time, but still, you know, dedicate enough of yourself to the job. I'll try to chime in as best I can. Um, for me, with my significant other, she has a good job. So we, we try to look at it, what situation is best for us combined, not just my career. And, you know, I take that into account. I, I really value that. Um, and, and like David said, um, at certain times you got to shut it down. And I, I know for me, making the jump from Division One to the pro levels, the work-life balance is a lot better. Like, you know, before I was getting calls, you know, one in the morning, two in the morning, three in the morning, like, and here in the two years that I've worked for two different head coaches in the G League, they never once called me after seven o'clock unless we're on the road and it was get dinner. Like they never bothered you when you're home, you're home, you're doing your job. They expect you to do it. You come ready to do your job. You know, practice is early in the day. No one hangs around after practice. You go home, you do your scout, you prepare for the next one, you keep it moving. And so, you know, by the time my significant other gets back home, hopefully I got all my stuff done and then, you know, it's kind of our time from there. But you know, it's a tricky thing. I think, you know, a million different ways to kind of navigate that. I think uh, what helped me, because I've been with my wife since I was in college. So she's been through all the playing everywhere and now coaching and moving and this and that. And so what helped me is I think just having an honest conversation on like, is this something that you want to do? You know, like, do you want to roll with me through all this? Or And if you do, this is what it's going to be like. And if you don't, then we have to have another conversation. And so I think if you if you try to make it sweeter than it is, that's going to backfire. I think you just have to be real and, and honest and have a tough conversation about, look, it's going to be like this. And it can get worse if, if something happens. We may have to move. We may have to do that. But if you're down, you're down. And, and if you're not, uh, you're not, and 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 that's kind of like a really, really. I know that's not the answer anybody wants to hear, but it's kind of the truth. Uh, it, it's the truth. If they don't support you, then then you're going to be miserable, and, and you're going to have to make a choice on if you want to continue doing this or if you want to uh, find another job. And so that's just what it was for me, and and we were able to work it out. Uh. Speaking of workflow and work, life, I also have two kids and, um, you know, definitely still trying to learn and figure it out as far as time. But I would say take advantage of the time. One thing, whether you're on the road or a road trip, 
work ahead when you can, take advantage of the time. Also understand how much time that you need for, you know, typically if you, you know, I don't know if you're doing multiple edits for a, a scout, maybe, you know, typically you, you can start to understand if, okay, I need two hours for this edit, or I need, you know, a large amount of time for that edit. Understand how much you time you need to, to do certain things, try to work ahead, try to take advantage of time when you're on the road. Also, um, if you have a spare 15 minutes, like you, you can get more done than you think in 15 minutes if you focus in, you know, with your lab. It might be you get to the gate of your flight and you're like, ah, oh, I can pull out my laptop or I can just wait for them to call me the board. But if you got an extra 20 minutes, use those 20 minutes because those time, that time can add up. Uh, as far as, you know, making the decision with the, with the wife, you know, I'm, I'm constantly in it. Like, I guess like Jimmy, my wife has a unique job and, uh, you know, part, I think it changes what I pursue situations. I pursue There's situations I wouldn't leave for, or, you know, my first year in Maine, I left and I was away from my family. And uh, for the first year of me coaching, and you know, we came to the decision that you know that that's not going to work for us anymore. So it's whether you know we all go or I don't go. You know, you come to that at certain points, you make certain decisions like that. But um, I think, like like Xavier said, to having honest conversations about things like that and what you value, what you prioritize, and if it's you know there might be a great job all the way in on the moon, but it might not be for you. You know, you might have to wait for the right situation that works for everyone and that's okay. You know. Something else to have thought of and I hate bringing it back, but it matters who you work for too. Your boss, if he's not a family man and he has a family and he doesn't want to go home, it's going to be miserable for your family. Um, that's the truth. And for us, like, in our staff, we've, we've been really lucky. Like we have a great culture. We have great family guys with our team. Like I know the other guys and staff's kids, like I know them and that's valuable to me. Cause I, I want that same thing if, when I have children too. And, you know, we play in the same arena that the New York Islanders play in. Like we go to a game with their families, like, you know, we're around each other. It's not just, we work together. Like, you know, we try to be all family together and spend that time and be intentional about it. So, you know, not everyone can pick their job and choose what they want, but, you know, if you go to a situation that the boss doesn't have much of a family life, it's going to be hard for you to have one too. No, really great advice. I mean, I think there's a lot of young coaches on this call, so it's good to kind of hear that advice now before you kind of get in those, uh, those situations where you're with uh, a significant girlfriend or a wife so that you kind of know what you're getting into as you progress through the coaching profession. So I really appreciate um, all four of those responses, coaches. Uh, Nate, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, uh, first off, thank you guys, uh, coaches, for um, just coming on and doing a Zoom chat. Um, I'm a head manager at Malone University D2, and I've asked uh, Jimmy this question kind of before, but um, what is kind of the best ways for, like, people who are interested in basketball operations in front office kind of to bring the best – to bring value to, to, like, a front office, like, to bring value through, like, that and, like, to like your operations staff, like a manager interested in that is uh, like, what are some of the roles and some of the different uh, values that you can bring like Intel reports, data analytics, you know, travel itineraries. What are some of the ways that you guys would recommend uh, going about that to attack something like that that you're interested in? My first inclination was to say, I don't know, <laughs> but I can guess. I think you answered some of your question that you asked, but also like uh, I'll steal a Dave quote, think outside the box. You know, I think when you're operations guy, especially in the G League level, you have to be a fixer. I call our guy like the fixer. There's gonna be some problems that come up or travel, or there's gonna be some things that, uh, not going to go as planned or is going to be difficult to as logistically. And I think if you can problem solve well and do that, so any way that you can show that besides the 
that side of you besides the Intel analytics and things like that. But um, if you can problem solve for them or show them that you can, you know, be an answer to a problem is always a good way to get attention of those who are above you. If you can show that you have answers or and, I'll, and bring solutions, you know, to maybe something that they face, then I think that'll go a long way. Yeah, I would I would kind of second that or jump jump on that. Like ask ask the guys uh, who are above you, um, kind of what what's on their their table, you know, what's on their plate, right? And whatever like the bottom thing is or the thing that they don't want to do, just take it off their plate for them, right? So so I'm sure the guys like everyone's always got five six things they got it they have to get done. So that that last thing they don't want to do, offer to do it for them. Um, and sometimes if you work for good people, they will recognize that if you don't, they'll just continue to try and pile on some stuff. So it, again, like Jimmy said, it all depends on the kind of person you're working for. But I think try and take some, some stuff off, off the guy's plates, um, ahead of you. And, and, and um, generally they, that's usually recognized. I'd also say backup plans, always having a backup plan for things, you know, because you know things like H say, you know it's going to go wrong. Something's going to go wrong. And so if you're thinking ahead and and just making it smooth for everybody and when something goes wrong, you're already on top of it because you already have a plan in place, I think that that changes the game. And so that's, what I, that's my little two cents that I would throw in there. I think more importantly than even just getting all the tasks done and being great with itineraries and that stuff, like, you got to be a great person. Like our operations guy in Long Island is a monster. Like he's the best I've ever seen anywhere. Like he he's tremendous. And I got to see him work, you know, for the last two years in our strength and conditioning coach, Rasan Robinson's on the call and he can, he can vouch for him. The guy that we have is great. And it's just, he's always a pleasure to be around every day. It's just easy to be around him. Like, like X said, he always has a backup. If something goes wrong. The dude has a plan. Like, we couldn't have a bus and we could be in Fort Wayne and he would have one on the way. Like that type of stuff and being the guy that has the answers, like Henry was saying, you can't like, you can prepare for it, but it's like having a child, like it doesn't matter how many books you read or whatever. It's not going to prepare you. Like for that role, you better have millions of solutions for any problem you don't even know you're going to have. Appreciate that coaches. Uh, Jason, you want to ask your question? Yeah. Um, this is kind of a question for anybody. You guys might probably will all have similar answers, so not everybody needs to answer it, but can you guys just take us through a day in the life of an assistant coach in the G League um, where David, Coach Gale, now uh, head coach overseas of a game day and a practice? Sure, I'll, I'll start. Yeah, so, um, uh, well, I think to answer the first part of your question, because I worked for three different coaches in three years in the G League, um, kind of like kind of like Henry's situation, right? Like it's um, each coach is going to be different. So uh, when it was uh, Jesse Mermis, we, we'd have a meeting before practice. We'd have a practice around 11 o'clock. Uh, and then um, guys would shoot, guys would lift. And then we would always work out together as a staff. We'd figure out a way to, to get that done. And I know some coaches do that. Like I know Kobe Carl does that um, with his staff with the South Bay team. Uh, when it was Coach Stackhouse, it was much longer days. Um, we were there from a coach's meeting at 6 in the morning to practice from 7 to 8.30 for player development. Uh, then we would have time where we could get our work done. And then we would come back for another practice at about 3 p.m. So we were going twice a day with, with Coach Stack. Um, and then in Delaware, it was more similar to what we did with the first year of 905, like one practice, coaches meeting. Uh, we kind of went out to eat together a lot there uh, at night because no one was from Delaware. So we kind of had to figure some things out there together. Um, and then for, for me, for a game day uh, in, in Germany, we would have a shoot around that generally – I think Henry and, and, and X can probably relate to this. Shoot around was not like NBA shoot arounds are an hour or G League shoot arounds are an hour. Like overseas shoot arounds can go however long the coach wants to go if you're in the home arena for sure. Um, so we would have long shoot arounds. We then had our team meal kind of similar to a college set up like that. Uh, 
And then you come back a lot. Um, the time before a game that you're in the arena is a lot shorter than in, in the G League or the NBA. You're only there for um, – we would get there like an hour and a half before the game and have about 45 minutes for shooting. But then you, your games start much later in the day. So you're playing at 8.30 p.m. Um, and then you've got the VIP room you have to go to in Europe. So you're up there. You're usually – I mean, we were in the arena till midnight a lot of nights. Um, and because I was part of two teams, I would have – a, I would have a, a U19 game that I was head coaching in the middle of the day and then the, the pro game at night. So um, it was long days in Europe, very long. Kind of my, my work, like our game day workflow, um, we would, a few of us would kind of get our lift in at eight in the morning and kind of be there together and make our way over to the facility at the game, like where we play our games at you know, around 10 o'clock or so, we'd meet as a staff at 10.30 and meet with the players at 11 and kind of go for like about an hour, like you said. You know, that brings you to roughly, you know, noon or so, a little bit after. Staff would kind of shower up, you know, talk about a few things, and then we'd go grab lunch together. And, you know, some guys might go home or whatever. I would stay at our facility, um, handle our rotations with the head coach, talk about the ATOs we're going to run that night, make sure we have the right lineups. We'd kind of script everything out we wanted to do. And then – after he would kind of do his own deal, that's when I would study the end of game stuff. So I have like a window from like three to five that I would kind of break down all the end of game that I want to prepare and make sure it's ready for him. And then I had the first guys on the floor at five o'clock and then I was done by five 30. I got to kind of chill for the next hour and a half. And like I said, like anything the head coach needs, I got that window and this is trying to, you know, prepare him as best possible. And that's kind of my game day. Yeah. Uh, game day for me was, pretty similar to these guys. Um, it, we would always kind of meet two to three hours uh, before shoot around. So shoot arounds at 11, we'd be in there at eight um, meeting and, and going through the scout and different schemes and what we're going to do, uh, have shoot around, go home. And when we talk about the work life balance piece, when I go home, that's when I try to hang out with the, with the boys. I have two sons, two young sons. So, uh, hanging out with them because I know I'm not going to really get to see them that day or hang out with them that day. So trying to plan before that and, and chill with them and see them. And then I go back to the gym at four. Um, Cause we would, you know, the young guys are, are on the court or guys that aren't going to play that much are, are on the court at four kind of going live. Um, and then I'd be out there for that. And then, you know, games at seven 30 and that's the day. So it's, it's long days. If you're a player looking into coaching, that's one of the biggest differences is that your uh, requirement, your time requirement changes drastically, you know, and I was one of the guys that would get there early or I thought I was getting there early, but not nearly as early as the coaches are getting there. So, you know, I'd go early and shoot and, and you know, just the transition, I, I was like, dang, the, you, like my coaches that I used to play for were here a lot earlier than I ever thought. Um, and it, it, it was an eye opener. And so I think that's one of the big, when people ask me what's the biggest difference between playing and coaching, just the time commitment. And then like coach Gale said, you know, it doesn't turn off. Like your mind doesn't turn off. I can't imagine what it's like being a head coach. Um, but even as an assistant this year, you're, you, you go home and you start thinking about what you could have done better. Or in, And even if you win, uh, you're thinking about, uh, the next game and so and as a player you kind of yeah, wired to let it go either win or loss you got to let it go and, and kind of clear your mind for the next game but as a coach it's completely different so that that was my uh, uh, game day routine uh, not a game day but a regular practice day is pretty similar to me, you know, we, we meet as a staff generally always before. Oftentimes I would be, or maybe one of the other guys, I'd get pulled out of that meeting early because somebody would want to shoot. And most of the staff that I've been a part of with players come first, you know, and I'm, I'm sure all you guys say that. So a lot of times I wouldn't even be able to finish the meeting. I think you see that often. And uh, help a guy shoot. And then we'd meet usually as a team, video, things like that. Then we practice. And um, if we were traveling, we tried to, we had a small, I guess, equipment staff and things like that. So you might be after practice, 
uh, helping pack, you know, often I felt like, you know, so many road trips we have, I'm helping pack the shoe bag or you're grabbing two bags, dragging them to the bus and then coming back, you know, things like that. Um, and then you start your individual work, whether it's there or you get, get home and start doing your scouts and, and things like that. But, um, I've been on different staffs where the, you, when you met as a staff, you got to plan practice with the coach or I've been with staffs where the coach kind of came and had the practice already planned, you know, for the most part. And we were just getting filled in on what parts we were going to do or just come getting up to speed with how practice was going to flow. So, you know, two different, I guess, mentalities, because one, you have to come fresh with ideas and the other, you got to be prepared to imp just implement the vision that he had. Um, so those are the only differences, I guess I could say for, for our practice, my practice, that's how practice day goes for us, for me. Uh, just, I want to just chime in one thing there from what Henry said and kind of what, what Jimmy said also, like um, making the coach's life, the head coach's life easier when you're, you're an assistant coach. Um, so when I, like when I worked under coach Stackhouse, it was kind of what Henry just said, uh, like he would come in with an idea of what he wanted to do, but um, one thing I took from one of the calls earlier this year um, was that Coach Van Gundy uh, would text his, his staff what he kind of wanted them to think about for the practice plan for the next day. So Coach Stackhouse was really good at that. He would text us the night before and kind of give us some ideas. He'd come in with his idea of what he wanted to do and then ask us for our input. Do we think this works? How does it go? And then as long as we came together and agreed on it, at the end of it, it was, you know, we would agree and then we'd roll out and it was his, it was his show, but that was kind of the way we, we planned out practice with him. Appreciate that coaches. Uh, I have a quick question for, for all of you who, who have a, who have an answer for this question. Obviously we're just coming through a pandemic where a lot of us had a lot more free time to kind of work on professional development within coaching, kind of getting better offensively, defensively, culture, different things you can do within your programs and your teams. How do you balance? So we talked about work-life family balance. We've talked about now professional development. So how, how do you best find time to be a great husband, be a great father, be a great coach in your current role, but still find time to try and develop yourself and, and prepare yourself to ultimately uh, what I assume most coaches on this call want to do is eventually be a head coach. So what does that balance look like for finding that balance of professional development to continue better yourself as a coach? I think Coach Gale kind of hit it on the head earlier. Uh, most successful people have a schedule. You know, they, they have a schedule. They write it out. Um, I've, I, find my, I found myself putting things in my calendar on my iPhone and having times where I, I do certain things in the day from this time to this time, and then I'm on to the next team thing from this time to this time. And it sounds – like 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 Coach Gill said, it sounds kind of like fake hustle or fake or whatever, but it's 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 not because you have to be organized in what you're doing and how you're doing it. So, I mean, writing down my to to do list, crossing stuff off, making a schedule, uh, putting things in the calendar. There's so many different apps that you can get um, that that are made for this. Um, I think you just kind of have to go for it and 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 take it seriously and, and really try to plan out your day. Because if you don't, we can get caught up on one thing and, and, and disregard the other things that are going on. So that's, I, th I think that's the best way. I, I would echo the same thing. Uh, I have a schedule every day that I try to follow and I think trying to stick to it without, you know, I haven't been on the court in a long time, but you know, I have like a like sticky notes on my desktop right here where every day is listed and I got to, you know, you know, Monday, I'm looking at this team's whatever, you know, next day, you know, I'm networking with these eight people. I got this call to be on and I promise you every single Zoom call that I can get on that's in the calendar because I just, I think the relationship building is really important for this business and showing who you are and trying to meet as many people at all different levels means more than, you know, having a great end of game set. So I think you got to be intentional about what you want out of this deal much like, you know, operate as if you were in the office, wherever you are, whatever your job is. And, but at the same time, turn it off, you know, cause like for me, it's a long time, like with the seating games in the bubble, I'm sitting there looking at basketball from nine in the morning to five 
and I'm watching the games in the background and all of a sudden it's midnight and you know, I've watched basketball for the last 15 hours and you, I think you got to turn it off sometime. Um, so I, I think, uh, for me, it, really having a schedule is one thing. Um, and, um, you know, Vinny Del Negro was the first person I saw do this was like, he, he, from what I was told, or like the rumors where he got jobs from being organized, right? Like he had binders, he had notebooks. And he always told me like, don't, I don't care how fast you do it. I just want it done right. And I want it organized and I want it the way I want it. So um, I really took that away from him. And, and so I've kind of, um, transition that but uh having a schedule and then i know a lot of us probably uh have trouble not being busy so um uh keeping yourself busy in different ways like um you know i uh whether it's for me right now during the pandemic i'm back uh in los angeles so i'm um trying to work out some younger kids that are, are coming up in like the high schools that i've i played at um in that in that area or reconnecting with people um, that I haven't seen in, in a long time that are now doing their thing out here and, and building something different and trying to, um, like I know, I know X texted me about doing, so he's doing something um, back home or, or you know, um, reconnecting with, with uh, coaches I played for and seeing what they're up to and kind of, you know, similar to the Zoom idea, but trying to steal ideas from them and, um, and you know really just trying to keep yourself busy somehow and then when, once you get back into your season i think um you know that schedule will help you uh plan out what's most important to you um so that that's the best advice i could give appreciate that coaches we're gonna uh, open it up to menelec for our last question and then we'll finish out uh and let everybody get on with their nights so menelec take us home Oh, no pressure. I got to end it off. Eh? Um, so I wrote this down a little bit because I want to structure it properly. Uh, I would say that the first part of it is a how important is, but like the topic is basically your own personal fitness and your personal well-being. And just a little background for those of you who don't really know me, I come from like a sales background. I've had a 13-year career in sales before. And one of the things that I hated about it was uh, in and around the travel and in and around the, the talk, uh, like around the water cooler, so to speak, the level of fitness really begins to drop off. So there is obviously an on court element to what we do, but there's a lot of sedentary stuff in what we do as well. So how are you gentlemen making time for, and would you say at your particular level that the culture is still conducive towards fitness and well being? And if it's not, what suggestions would you make? or what suggestions would you make for up and coming coaches to be able to take care of themselves while they're pursuing this venture? Um, I think each situation is different, but no, I, I haven't been with a coach who does the staff workout. I would love that, you know, especially being a former player and, you know, I want to maintain the, sh you know, I'm used to yeah. being in professional athlete shape and I'm why I, I've watched it dwindle away, <laughs> dwindle away. But um, one thing, you got to be intentional. Like, you know, you've been hearing the word schedule, schedule. But you really got to fight for it and be intentional about it. Um, and balance it with your workflow, obviously. And like they say, schedule it in. But also it may be, you know, when they stretch, if you don't have anything to do while you're on the court, hey, you stretch too. If they're going through a dynamic warm-up, you get your dynamic warm-up in. And, you know, if, if somebody got to do push-ups, you do push-ups with them, you know. I think that stuff will go a long way. Um, and like I said, like, like the other coaches said, whether it's, you're going to have to give up some, you know, this game, sometimes you don't get to sleep as much as you want, but you're going to have to give something up for it. Whether it's, you're going to have to give up that extra hour of sleep before you get on the bus, you got to go down to the, to the weight room in, you know, in the hotel or whatever it is. But that's why building a routine, you know, greatness has a routine, right? If you build a routine, it'll become easier but you really got to be intentional about putting it in for your health. And also I think something that's good and that there's value in is when your team sees you working out or if they're in the weight room and if there's space or something and they see you putting in some work, it's a way you can connect with them, laugh with them. And, but they also see that you're putting in somewhere you're quote unquote grinding with them. I think there's some value in that as well. 
I also think I, I second all of that. And, and I think that it's just finding your thing. You know, I, when I was playing, it was coaches that did it all different ways. It was one coach that everywhere we went, he found a yoga studio and he went to go do yoga. Um, I had a coach that everywhere we went, he went and changed and he went on a run, you know? And so like, you just have to find your thing that you enjoy. Um, and, I, and I also don't think that it necessarily has to be uh, physical exercise. I also, I, I think that it's the eating part. You know what, you know, we, we probably won't be able to exercise today because, you know, things get hectic, especially in the G League. If you ever travel with the G League teams, you, you probably, you might not have time in a day to do anything um, once you get to the hotel, but I'll make sure that I eat right because, you know, eating, you, you hear that stat, it's like 80% of, of being healthy is eating anyway. And so, uh, saying, hey, you know what, I'm going to stick to this diet for this two weeks, boom, that, that's, that's going to be my workout. Um, and so it's just different ways, and you have to find your thing that you do um, and stick with it. And, again, I'll say it again, get that schedule going. Coach, just, just before anybody else answers, one thing that I think, uh, like, really resonates with me with what you just said is the one year that I was on a girls team uh, – like the one year I was in women's basketball, our team ate significantly healthier than any of the men's teams that I've been on. Like they right. really took the time to plan that out. It was really interesting to me. I was like, you know, we're supposed to be in health and fitness and we really don't think about that on the men's side the way that we should. Like we should be having more team dinners at particular places, et cetera. Right. Uh, yeah, no, I think that that's huge. And he, he, even if the team isn't doing it, uh, and I went on a few diets this year, and it was really hard. But even if the team wasn't doing it, you can you can still do it and, and knock it out yourself, you know. Yeah, I think um, I think what Henry said, finding time it like in practice or in in the arena at some point is is really big. Like uh, getting out on the court and running. Yeah, if it's the end of practice and guys have to run, you know, a training camp is an example, the free throw running drill, like, right, you miss a free throw, everyone's got to run, run with the team. Um, one thing that uh, working with Toronto with Jamal McGlure there, um, uh, he used to make us all feel bad if we didn't do 100 push-ups in the pregame. So it was like you'd have your guy and then you'd go on the side and you do 25 push-ups and then you get 25 more. And Every pregame, we try to get 100 push-ups in. Um, I think also, like what H said, like, uh, uh, you know, um, get used to not sleeping, right? Find some time, uh, wake up early, go to sleep late, whatever, whatever it may be. But um, you have to find that time in the day um, to get it in. So, like, like I said, like we would run the stairs in the arena um, before, the, before the players even got there because um, you have to figure out somewhere to do it. and then. Um, the eating healthy aspect of it is obviously huge. When you're in pro sports, uh, you know, um, in Delaware, we were, we, in 905, we didn't have food with, uh, after games. In Delaware, I know um, Elton started giving post-game meals in the, D -League, or in the G League at that time. So it, it's very easy to just load up and eat everything in front of you. Um, like in the NBA, you get on a team plane and there's just food. And then you have a team meal and there's food. And so it's really easy. So you really got to – have to watch your diet and just figure out that time to get it in. For me, like I, I didn't play professionally. So I took it like really prideful to be always in the weight room. Like anytime the guys were there, I was the first one in the building anyways, not to just do that because I wanted to get shit out of the way. And I'm always in there lifting, getting my stuff in so that I can, you know, prepare for the head coach. So that's what I would do uh, for that part of it. On the road, I would pack food to bring and I would search out places for food ahead of time. And knowing that in me and the head coach, uh, we like similar things in a sense, like going to healthy spots, whether it's like salad place, smoothie place, whatever that is, and being intentional about it. And on the road, there was like four or five of us that would always lift in the morning in the hotel. It would be like seven in the morning and you can count on the same people being there. And, you know, we, you kind of develop a bond that way and it kind of feels like home a little bit. You see the same people work out, feeling good, go to breakfast together. and. Uh, it was just a way to hold each other accountable and be like, oh, because if someone's not there, they'd be like, hey, where's Jimmy? Like, why is he not here? Uh, so that was just something easy that I think can be replicated across any level. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you very much. 
All right, that, uh, that, that wraps us up for tonight. Just, just want to leave everyone with a couple of closing thoughts. Again, just want to thank everyone for coming on again tonight. We really appreciate the support we've gotten the past two weeks. We hope that uh, coaches and uh, of all levels have been able to learn uh, a handful of things that will help them better themselves. I want to thank Coach Oakman, Coach Gale, Coach Henry, and Coach Silas for coming on. Uh, this week was a little bit last minute, so we appreciate us. Fit, we appreciate them fitting us into their schedule. Obviously, uh, they're very busy with a lot of things to do on their plate. So again, we appreciate all four of you coaches coming on and, and sharing some wisdom with the rest of us. Uh, just want to kind of leave you guys with another initiative that that we started. So Safet Castrat, um, a manager, a rider. We started a weekly uh, a networking Zoom call for coaches that are looking to continually meet people and coaches in the profession, even as we kind of transition back to the office. So we're going to drop that link. Um, in the chat right now. So if you're interested in, in coming on, it's going to be Saturdays at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time every Saturday. Just a platform for coaches to continually meet new people and continue to learn and grow in this business. So again, just want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Really appreciate the support we've gotten. And we definitely have some events in the coming in the coming weeks that we, uh, we hope we can have your support with as well. So thank you again for everyone coming out tonight. Yep. Appreciate everyone. Like Caleb just said, thanks for coming. Coaches, panelists, thanks for uh, dropping your knowledge and thanks everyone. Stay in touch. I'll echo that just before I end the call. Thank you to all of the panelists. That was that was really awesome. Really appreciate you guys taking the time. And I want to give a big thanks to Caleb and Jason for organizing this. This is great, gentlemen. Keep doing what you're doing. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you guys. Really appreciate it. Likewise, appreciate all the panelists too. Thank you guys.